Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Adams. I head up strategic intelligence in ASIC, but I'm also the coordinator of ASIC's Innovation Hub. And it's great to have so many of you here tonight. I want to do a quick few thank yous first up. I want to thank Kim and the Sydney FinTech Meetup for hosting tonight's event. I want to thank Andrew and the Tyro Hub for this venue. It's fantastic. Thank you for that. And I also want to thank my uh, fellow regulators here for making themselves available. And also thank you to you for coming along. So we'll get straight into it. Our aim today, and we've had brief chats together, is that we, we want to give you an idea about where do we fit in the picture, what's our agency's role, why are we interested in fintech, what, what can we do for you, and touch on a few issues and so on which might be relevant for each one of us. And our aim is to leave as much time as possible for Q&A. You can't go far without talking numbers or pictures or statistics about fintech. Here's just a few. They're from a number of reports. Uh, that really just confirms why probably so many of you are here, but it also confirms perhaps why regulators are interested as well. Uh, there is a huge growth trend, there's potential opportunities to provide benefits for the real economy and consumers and users. Uh, there are also challenges and potential risks. So with all that happening, uh, with all this development and all this potential, uh, hence we're all here. Now, I've got a couple of slides here which are just trying to give you a little bit of an illustration of the regulatory picture and where we all fit in. I'll leave it to my colleagues to talk about their own agencies and their role. But if you look at this picture, you can see Australia's got some fairly straight lines. This is from the Financial System Inquiry Interim Report, and I have added the privacy or OAIC on the, on the far right. So you can see in the Council of Financial Regulators, there's a, uh, we've got a small set of regulators and we've got a number of entities who play national roles or across industries like the Privacy Commission and like uh, Austrac. Let me just dwell on ASIC briefly. So we are the market conduct and corporate regulator. Our, our objectives are to promote uh, fair, orderly, transparent and efficient markets and to promote confident informed investors. And it's against that backdrop that the Commission made a call last year that we will uh, place re uh, resources to support an innovation hub initiative. Our ambition is to uh, promote benefits for consumers, to, to uh, provide efficiencies to the market, and to, at the heart of it, is to provide assistance to people so that they get a streamlined sort of understanding of the regulatory framework. So that's what's behind it for ASIC. This, this lens is also from the FSI report, and this is trying to give you a bit of an idea about the different kinds of financial regulatory uh, approaches. So what you can see here is that if you're a financial institution in that big sense, and you want to do product issuance like a bank or an insurer or something like that, and some of you may have ambitions in that territory, well, that's the territory which gets the most overlap in terms of regulation, as you could imagine. The other area is probably the serious plumbing area of payments. It equally gets uh, a number of regulators here interested in that operation. But I would suggest the greater bulk of you here in terms of the fintech sector are interested perhaps more on the left-hand side, which really gets ASIC's remit, which is the conduct regulation of financial services. So let's look in that little list. I've bolded a couple. Marketplace lenders, it's really us. Uh, when it comes to sort of FX dealers, it's really us. Whether you wish to provide digital advice and intermediary services, it tends to be mostly ASIC. Um, Non-cash payment facility area is another one which cuts across a few areas. The last one I wanted to just mention is the outside the perimeter area. So there is another interesting case. So we've obviously got digital currencies currently in that position. If you're just simply involved in digital country, currencies, not creating other forms of structured products in relation to them, well, that's currently outside the perimeter. In addition to that is perhaps third-party service providers. So many third-party service providers are not necessarily in the regulatory framework. But that doesn't mean some of the regulators here might not be interested in the regulators, the regulated entities' use of third-party providers. So there is always a, perhaps an indirect interest in third-party service provision. Now, when you go back to that Australian picture there, you may say, gee, that couldn't look a bit complex, and gee, I don't want all that overlap. I just wanted to give you an idea of USA. 
Um, this is from a recent report. If you think we might be complex and challenging, just think of USA. It is such a spaghetti in terms of the potential entities. I'm not trying to belittle the USA. It's obviously got so many advantages in many other respects. But in this respect, I think this is one of the advantages. And I think it's demonstrated by the fact we've got five regulators here today. The ability for us to pull together and collaborate in Australia is something that is, places us in a good position. The ASIC Innovation Hub. I won't go to town on this. Many of you have heard things on that. But I wanted to give you a bit of a progress report. So down the bottom, 100 meetings and plus with stakeholders in the sector. That's part of our engagement ambition and perspective. So that can be a fintecher, that can be consultancy, that can be a law firm. Plenty of people want to talk about the sector. 81 entities we've been engaging with. Some of them have requested assistance, but some of them came to our attention because they applied for a licence or they applied for relief or something like that. Of the 81, you can see in the pie chart a variety of the kind of business models. Digital advice tends to still be the entity where all the business model that we get most inquiries about, but it's not limited to that, is a good spread, as you could imagine. And in that other territory, I should have put in the brackets there, blockchain as well. Uh, an increasing area of entities wanting to ask questions about where that fits in the picture. Uh, the last thing down the bottom left is 56 entities which have requested informal assistance from ASIC using ASIC's webpage and have sought informal meetings with ASIC. That leads to this slide. So I really, fundamentally, my major message to you is that if you are interested about understanding how the ASIC regulatory framework may apply into you, contact us. And you can contact us by going to our webpage, going to the Innovation Hub website and filling in an informal assistance request. And we had some feedback from some entities. 85% of the people who replied to our survey said, yep, I'd recommend it to someone. So I'm really urging you, if you're thinking about that, to do that. The other part to that message is, sure, you may have professional advisors. I don't want to belittle professional advisors. But you can come and talk to us. Whether or not you have a professional advisor, you can bring the professional advisor. So I just don't want you to think as though, don't come to ASIC. Major message number one. Recently, we issued a consultation paper on digital advice. If this is the territory you're interested, I'd really recommend you have a look at it and read it. It's actually open for comment at the moment, so we're happy to receive comments by sort of mid-May. It deals with practical questions like competency, organisational competency, and we ask questions about that. Do you need to have a responsible manager who meets our RG146 training requirements? We propose yes. It also talks about uh, risk and controls around algorithms. Do you need to have appropriate arrangements? Obviously, yes. Do you need to have self-certification or get third-party certification of your algorithms? We're not proposing so, but we ask questions to that effect. So get into that paper, a lot of interest in there. Marketplace lenders, they knock on our door and say, my word, only if we had had this information sheet from ASIC ages ago. That's part of the challenge at all, but we've put out an information sheet which tries to bring together the sort of regulatory framework that applies to those business models who want to use retail, they want to get retail investment and they want to in some way provide a platform to consumer credit uh, provision. So have a look at that information sheet, provides a lot of information for people thinking in that territory. I wanted to spruik the FCA cooperation agreement. Uh, I think it's now two weeks ago. We signed up to the world's first cooperation agreement with the FCA in UK, the Financial Conduct Authority. And this has got two elements to it. One is they are just one example of who we speak to on a quarterly basis. There's about eight international regulators that we do this to and have a chat with, and they are at the heart of it. So that's part of the cooperation agreement. The second part, importantly, is I think a bit of a referral process. So let's, came, let's say you came and knocked on our door for informal assistance. You went through the process and applied for a license and got your license. Now you're saying, gee, I can do the same thing in UK. I want to think about going to UK. What we will do is provide a referral to the FCA and they commit to engage with that entity and vice versa. So that's the benefit of that cooperation agreement. We'll see whether more occur. Oh, go. The last thing I wanted to say, of course, is regulatory sandbox. What is a regulatory sandbox? I have a two and a half year old child and I'm constantly thinking about sandboxes. Uh, I think there is a question about its definition, but let's just try to define it here. There's clearly an issue perceived in the sector 
that I want to be able to engage real time, fast with retail clients to experiment and pivot what I'm doing. Now, we would suggest there is already existing flexibilities, but that's the challenge point. And there is a lot of active engagement, I can say right now, between industry, ASIC, government, and treasury. I think all I can say is stay tuned. I can't give more detail on that. Um, but I did want to close with saying there are already flexibilities which provide for entities wishing to operate in the financial services space. So we have a modular licensing regime. You can pick and choose the kind of license that you want to seek and the obligations that therefore flow. You could choose to be an operator of an authorised, be an authorised rep of a licensee today. That obviously means commercial negotiation. That obviously means time. And that's obviously seen as one of the issues that people have raised with us. Organisational competency, we have discretion. And, I, we have a, uh, and what I want to say about that is there's at least a dozen or so entities more recently in the fintech sector that we have applied that discretion in terms of recognising organisational competency. We provide the informal assistance which I talked about. And lastly, we already have a policy framework that anticipates giving waivers and no action letters. We have a waiver that exists on a class level for non-cash payment facilities now, where it's just limited to low value, and many entities are making use of that flexibility. And for the marketplace lenders, every marketplace lender that's come to us, we've granted them individual relief. So we use the power in the existing framework. So I'm sure that may whet the appetite for questions later on, but that's enough from me, and I'm gonna pass now to Tony.